So our next speaker is another progressive politician. It's Fiona Patton, uh, who is from the Legislative Council in the Parliament of Victoria, and she's also the national leader of the Australian Sex Party. And some of the things that Fiona has been lobbying for include the decriminalisation of cannabis, the expansion of sex education in schools and voluntary euthanasia. And she's talking to us today about opportunities in a regulated marijuana market. Please welcome Fiona. Whoa, I'm in the headlights or the spotlight now. Thank you, um, thanks very much. And thank you to Hemposium and Mardi Gras for allowing me to come here today. I'm just going to work something out here. Now, one thing I'd just like to say at the, right from the start is that um, when I, I think, was first asked to speak here today, I, I don't think I'd actually been elected. And um, so I was a, a hopeful member of parliament. And in fact, last time I spoke here in 2013, I was, I was a very hopeful member of parliament. So today in 2015, it's very exciting to be here as an actual member of parliament. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> However, it has, um, it has taught me a few things and certainly listening to Richard before, um, reality is starting to set in about what you can uh, achieve in, in the parliament and uh, you do have to be incredibly practical. So I started with this great aspiration of that I was going to be developing policy and, and of course legislation and I would be passing it in the first six months of being elected around a huge commercial cannabis industry that we would tax, we would regulate, we would set up licensing, uh, we would be looking at the models from Colorado, the models from Washington. And I have to say that I think at this point in time that is quite aspirational. And it is, it is achievable but it is aspirational. So while I do want to get to the subject of tax and, and how I think it is a crucial component to ending prohibition. Uh, I don't think we can do it without regulation and, and in some ways I see that regulation to also include financial regulation. Um, I want to talk about initially about some of, I guess, the parts I've managed to play in the few short months that, that I have been elected. And, and I have to say that in, in thinking about today, I reckon I actually got elected because I smoke pot. And I'm probably one of the few members of parliament who can say I got elected for smoking a joint. Um, but I, in the lead up to the election, I put out an editorial in The Age about how I smoked marijuana uh, and, and why I thought that that shouldn't be a crime and the fact that I wanted to be open and I didn't want to be a hypocrite and I didn't want to be a liar um, like so many of my colleagues have been described as. I'm not to say that they are, but some of them have been described as being hypocrites and liars. But I didn't want to be that. And so I put that out. And it was, it was remarkable. Like it got shared thousands and thousands of times from the ages website. Um, it, it created this incredibly kind of positive, like, oh, well, at least someone's, you know, saying they did inhale. And not only that I did inhale in college, but I still inhale. And that I saw that that should be my choice and it should be that governments shouldn't have the right to make those choices for me. Um, but it didn't get like this, oh, my God, we can't vote for some pothead. It got quite the opposite. And I do think that that actually improved my vote. And... Um, since, um, since that time, I've, um, I've, you know, I haven't smoked any more joints, I haven't smoked any joints in Parliament. Uh, <laughs> but then I had an interview, once I was elected, the Guardian newspaper came and saw me and they said, well, you know, you say you've smoked pot. And I said, yes, that's true. And they said, well, have you tried ecstasy? I said, yes, yes, I have. I said, what about cocaine? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, LSD? Yeah, you got me on that one too. Um, and they went through this. And so this was all published in The Guardian. And yet all they wanted to talk about, in the end, the journalist, was, 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 wasn't even very interested in my drug 
use and my drug history, she was more interested in whether we should call the party the sex party. And I listened to Will with interest on civil liberties uh, and how that civil liberties does not uh, change, change debate and may not change um, opinion. And I certainly, I was talking to some year 12 students, year 12 students at Parliament the other day and I said, hands up, uh, who knows what civil liberties are? Not a single one. And I said, that's why we're called the sex party. Um, and it's absolutely true. So, <laughs> so since, I've, but since I've been elected um, as the sex party and my colleagues are getting very used to saying the word sex, so it's very good for them. I'm not sure they're practising it, but they're certainly becoming good at saying it. And um, I get riled quite a lot while I'm there. But I, I, so I've started asking, I realised um, that I can ask questions now, I'm a Member of Parliament, and in theory, the government is supposed to answer them. I've also found out very quickly that question time is question time, it's not answer time. And if they can avoid answering anything, they will. But I constantly ask them questions without notice and questions on notice about how much they're spending on prevention. You know, with their new ICE plan, they put $45 million on enforcement and sniffer dogs and drug, and drug buses, side, roadside buses, and I said, but they didn't put a figure next to prevention. And I said, how much are you going to spend on that? Um, I'll ask them questions about needle exchange programs. I will ask them questions about all sorts of things. And I think this is the great thing about having some socially progressive members of parliament and, and possibly being from a small party. So, you know, my caucus is me putting on lipstick in the morning going, well, what do you think about this? I reckon we should talk about bicycle day. You know, does, does, do people know what bicycle day is? Yay, I know, we, I'm sure many of you, many of us maybe recently celebrated it. Uh, a, lot of my member, a lot of the members of parliament don't know what Bicycle Day is. I'm sure you are shocked to hear. So I gave a little speech, an adjournment speech um, about Bicycle Day and, and told them the story of Philip Hoffman and, and how when he first tried LSD and, oh sorry, Albert Hoffman, yeah. That's the other guy, Seymour Hoffman, he's a dead one. Albert Hoffman, he, um, he, how he tried it and he'd rode his bicycle home and he'd had this a, a, a fantastic trip and, and, um, and, but what I was getting to, and they all laughed and, you know, said, oh, well, I bet he then shot someone and I bet he did this and I had lots of interjections. But what I, particularly from a woman called Inga Pulich, and, but what I was getting to was, However, what they were using LSD for at the time when it was synthesised was they were looking at how it tre how, treating alcoholism, treating depression, treating other uh, clinical and mental, he mental health issues and how they were found finding some great results from this. And the reason they could do it was because it was legal. And when we prohibited LSD, we stopped all of those clinical studies and we stopped all of that successful work that was being done at the time Anyway, that, that seemed to go over the head of Inga Pulich, who had then stormed out of the chamber and said, well, I'm off to the bar for a drink. And I just... And I went, Seriously, you know, if she was being ironic, it would have been funny. It would have been great. Unfortunately, she wasn't. She was just off to the bar for a beer and a cigarette outside because she was sick of hearing me talk about drugs. And... <laughs> So, you know, it does. I've also had the ability... So, I mean, this is the sort of thing I get to talk about in, in politics, and I hope that I can raise that debate. And I, I understand what Richard has been saying about the fact that we have to, to step with medicinal cannabis, and I get that, and I get the medicinal cannabis has to be treated very specifically and treated as a medicine and drug law reform and the rights for us as adults to make decisions about what drugs we take and why we take them is another debate. But I do think it's a debate that I want to keep pushing along and I want to keep pushing it along now. Um, uh, sorry, I was just trying to read notes and... and, um, and 
So in, in doing that, I've, I've been given an intern, which is very exciting for a party that's run on, you know, oily rags. So I get an intern and she is doing a study that will be out in, in June um, about how we could set up a commercial and regulated model for cannabis as a whole, not just medicinal, but for, for all uses of cannabis. And I, 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 I know it's going to be, it's going to be a very exciting report and it's going to look at the existing models and I hope that we will come out with some great proposals for policy. But that is separate from, from medicinal cannabis. But just on that drug law reform debate, I think very sadly that the deaths of, um, of Andrew Chan and, and Sukumaram uh, the other day uh, actually have, has, has, they have gone from sort of scumbags to martyrs in my mind. Um, eight, eight, it, wouldn't, it would probably, I was talking about this earlier, about eight weeks ago, the sex party put out a boycott Indonesia campaign. And we said, if, you know, how dare they, you know, this, this is wrong, we can't be killing Australians, we can't be killing anyone. You know, so it, was a, it certainly was an anti-death penalty, but we called out on boycott, to boycott Indonesia. And we were pillarised. We were yelled at. We had thousands of people attacking us on our websites and on our social media saying, how dare you, they've done the crime, they should do the time. Drug smugglers, blah, blah, you know, and all of this incredibly hateful um, dialogue. And that was what was happening in the papers as well. And we have seen that turn around in just eight weeks. And we have seen even the Murdoch press saying that this was wrong, that these drug smugglers should not have been murdered. And they, eight weeks ago, they were calling them scumbags and now they are actually attacking the Indonesian government. And I think we've seen Ted, uh, Matt Knopfs wrote some great pieces in the conversation. We saw this turnaround that we can't take a moral high ground against Indonesia when we are fo philosophically aligned with them in drug laws. When we, are, when we treat um, drug users as criminals, then we are not that much different. And we need to, to take, we need to change our policies and we need to change our approach to drug laws uh, if we want to save people from being killed in countries over, um, in, in other countries. And this also led me to something that Alex Wodak had said in the media. And I know Dr. Alex will be up here later. But he was saying that, let's remember that prohibition is a relatively new thing. You know, we haven't had it round for that long. And I started looking at opium, obviously, with, in light of what had happened with, um, with Chan and Sukumaran. And, you know, we taxed opium here. We taxed the import of opium. You know, we made actually a lot of money in Australia. And I was looking back at Victoria, by chance, had a drugs council, a parliamentary drugs council, something that is on my to-do list to, to reinstate. And they said that there was three types of opium users in Victoria. The first class was middle-aged and middle-class women who used opium for um, menstrual pain and... Um, and depression. The second class was doctors and nurses who used it to relieve stress. And the third class was Chinese migrants. And I just want to read to you, in 1905 they effectively banned it, and it was, it was racism that actually caused the ban. But they went on to say, I just wanted to, I wrote this down. Owing to the total prohibition of the price of opium, that, owing to the total prohibition, the price of opium has risen enormous, enormously. The Commonwealth gladly gave up £60,000 of revenue for a view to suppression of the evil. But the result has not been what has been hoped for. What now appears to be the effect of total prohibition is that we have lost the duty. The opium is still imported pretty free freely. And this was the head of customs writing this um, in, in 1906. So that was £60,000. I've got no idea what that's worth in our, in our time, but I'd like to say £60 million. Um, And we look at Colorado and we look at the models there, and I think we've got some people from the Colorado industry speaking this afternoon, which is fantastic. Uh, and they were telling me last night that they're raising about $76 million uh, in taxes in Colorado. 
Um, you know, money's going to schools, it's a fabulous thing. Alison, Alison Ritter from University of New South Wales wrote a very interesting paper where she estimated $600 million in taxes if we legalised and regulated um, all sales of cannabis in New South Wales alone. Um, I, I um, in my previous work as the leader of the, um, of the Eros Association, I spent a lot of time talking to police, um, mainly about porn, but also about drugs. And um, I, I still speak to senior drug squad people. In fact, I had dinner with one not that long ago. And um, he, was, uh, he was telling me that, you know, he's on the same page as us, privately. He understands that, um, that what they're doing isn't working uh, and that we need, we need to look at a, a new approach. And he, uh, and you know, uh, and then following from that, the senior drug squad from Victoria noted that they take $1.5 billion. Uh, they estimate that the, the, the hothouses, the hydroponic grown cannabis in Victoria is worth $1.5 billion. Now, if we tax that at 30%, well, $1.5 billion. I think we're looking at about $300 million. You know, I mean, that's just one state. So, and, and uh, 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 Robert's not here, but when I was giving a parliamentary, I was, I was addressing a Senate inquiry into the new psychoactive substances or the synthetic cannabises and uh, the like, I, I argued this case and I had, a, I had Ian, Mac Senator MacDonald, saying, really, we could make that much if we regulated it? Seriously, Fiona? He said, oh, have you spoken to the treasurer about this? And, you know, I nearly had him won over, you know. Um, sadly, it wasn't to be the case. But, you know, it, it, I do think that we do, you know, the devil will be in the detail and I know in Colorado they have not got the model exactly right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for me to see this as something that I will aspire to. But I do believe that we can set up a model that... Taxes at a low enough level that we keep it, keep the price out of the black market. So we need to keep the price um, at a level that it can compete with the black market or that the black market can't compete with it. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so we do, we, um, but it's keeping that, so if we are talking about tax, we tax it low enough to keep the black market out. But a legal industry does have extra costs, and that is extra costs on regulation, controls, testing, etc. So we do have to bear that in mind. And as I say, I think the devil will be in the detail here on how we do this. But we also need to remember that people like to buy a legal product. Um, you know, this this was found. You know, in uh, in the new psychoactives um, that are emerging, and you know the synthetic cannabis or whatever you might want to call it, in those new psychoactives that were being sold in adult stores or legal stores legally, we did a survey on why people bought them and the ma vast majority bought them because they were legal, not because they were better than the illegal pot that they could get, that they could get. my word no, in fact, in most cases it certainly was not better, but it was the fact that it was legal, and I think we should always we should consider that when we're going down a path of taxation. Um, anyway, I'm, I don't want to speak too much longer. I do want to say that I went to Portugal, and I understand the savings. So you've got taxation, but in this country, we spend four billion dollars on uh, in, on our prohibition model. Uh, Seventy-five percent on the, of that is spent on policing, and less than five percent is spent on actually. Um, supporting uh, users, problematic users. So even if we legalised all drugs tomorrow and that doubled the number of problematic users, we would still be saving money. I'm not suggesting that's the way to go, but I, when we're spending such a small amount on problematic users, I think we can afford to spend less on enforcement and more on, on, on the problematic user. And as Richard mentioned Portugal decriminalised all the use and possession of all drugs in 2001 uh, and that, that, that legislation has remained, it has had extraordinary outcomes and I'm happy to elaborate on the outcomes there but 
what it did is it meant that, uh, you know, I actually was there, I watched them with a guy who'd got done for cocaine be heard by the, um, I think, beautifully named Drug Dissuasion Commission, where they spoke to this guy about his cocaine use. They, they talked about his, actually ended up talking more about his alcohol use, which led to his cocaine use. And in the end, what they, they finished with was a three-page report, one page written by the police who'd found it, one page written by the psychologist, and one page written by the Dissuasion Commission that recommended and booked him in to see a counsellor about his alcohol use. Uh, three pages, as opposed to even when we do a diversion in this country, or even if something gets to court of those 82,000 arrests, we get this much paperwork. So we know that we can save a lot of money by you know, not criminalising people at the very least. Uh, so I'm sorry that I didn't talk more about um, tax, but I think it's something that the experts need to do, talk to us about. And, and as a politician, I want to hear from the experts about this. Uh, I'm also a politician who's having a little bit of a break. And so I got Ben Elton's High Society. Has anyone read that book? It, it, it was written in 2003 but it talks about this secret treasury report. And um, I just loved reading it, you know, by chance this week. And in this secret treasury report, they say it's the boldest shift in social management since the introduction of the welfare system. If we use, if we treat drugs, you know, and treat them in the same way and have laws that use the laws of fair, fair trade, we will wipe out 90% of the nation's crime networks, um, they were talking about a government that would import the products cheaply and then sell them expensively, bringing immense profit to Treasury. We could cut income tax by half. And most importantly, we wouldn't lose another election until doomsday. So there was a political incentive to this, and I think they've got a point. What I also loved is they wanted to set up a minister of drugs. and. Um, I'm actually putting my hand up for that when I get back down to work next week. Uh, but I would encourage you to, uh, to... The Victorian Law Reform Commission is currently looking at medicinal cannabis. We need to get that model right. I think we need to have it as a commercial model as well as a compassionate model. So there needs to be a commercial structure. There needs to be a compassionate structure. There needs to be a structure that we can grow our own within it. Um, but that structure, I want to see that structure good that, that then sets us up as Colorado did for a much broader position. And at the same time, I will also be pushing for non-criminalisation of all possession and all use um, of all drugs. Thanks. Thanks.